Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here as we join other states across the country in recognizing Careers in Construction Month. And we're joined by industry leaders today to talk about the importance of this sector in our everyday lives and the need to promote the industry. As you all know, this is the world I grew up in. I've always had a passion for building things and working with my hands. And um, my first two years at Spalding High School, I took my first industrial arts courses. During my junior and senior years, I took college prep classes in the morning and then would head off to the machine trades program at the vocational school in the afternoon. After high school, I even studied to become a CTE instructor at UVM. I did my student teaching at U32 and received my teaching certification before eventually uh, going into business instead. For me, personally, the trades was incredibly rewarding. When you build something, you can see the fruits of your labor right before your eyes. It's tangible, it's visible, and to me it's so fulfilling because you can see the progress on a daily basis. I know many of you have heard me say this before, but I'll say it again because it's true. Some of the most successful, smartest people I know never got a four-year degree, or even went to college for that matter. They instead chose a path in the trades. And I think as a state, we can do a better job promoting the career path, making our kids aware of the opportunities earlier. This year, We've made significant investments in CTE, while well, Secretary French will speak about that shortly. We know we have a tremendous need in this state for people with this talent. And I'm sure you'll hear from industry here today, there are many good paying jobs available right now, but we simply don't have the people to fill them. As we look to next, year's, uh, next year and the years ahead, this will be an even bigger challenge, given all the new infrastructure projects in the pipeline. You've heard us talk a lot about the billions we're investing in the coming years in housing, broadband, water, sewer, and stormwater infrastructure, roads and bridges, and more. But no matter how much money we appropriate, the work will need to be done by people, which will be an increasing challenge given our de demographics but also an opportunity for so many young Vermonters to find a fulfilling, lucrative career in the trades. In addition to highlighting career and technical education, my administration is also working on apprenticeship programs, job placement, training, and more. Deputy degree will have a, uh, deputy commissioner degree will have a, a more uh, on that shortly. And before I turn it over to Dustin, I. Um, I just wanted to say that I truly believe that everyone is born with a gift, a unique, unique talent of some sort. But sometimes we don't discover it until we explore and try new things. That's why we need to make sure as many boys and girls are exposed to different opportunities in their educational experiences. It's great to have uh, Ronnie uh, uh, Bazin here with us today, direct, director, uh, executive director of Vermont Works for Women um, to make clear that trades aren't just for boys. Opportunities are there for women and girls as well. As I said in my State of the State address in January, to me, it's just as important, valuable, and impressive to become an electrician, welder, or EMT, or get a CDL, as it is to get an Ivy League education. We just need to open more doors for people and show them the options. My team and I will continue to work with stakeholders to do just that. So with that, I'll turn it over to Deputy Commissioner Degree, and I'll come back to read and sign the proclamation after remarks are given from our guests. Dustin. Thank you, Governor. Uh, good afternoon, uh, and the Department of Labor is incredibly happy to be here with all of you today. We're happy to help celebrate careers in construction here in Vermont, the folks that perform them, uh, and the opportunities available in this sector of our economy. Anyone who's needed the service of a skilled contractor in the last few years understands the importance of highlighting and supporting these jobs, as well as helping to educate folks, especially students and young people, on just how lucrative and rewarding these careers are for those who choose to pursue a job in the trades. 
In 2001, construction establishments accounted for over 10% of all businesses and provided over 5% of total employment, paying out an average wage of $57,635 a year, exceeding the state average of all wages by nearly 3%. And there's plenty to go around. The Department of Labor estimates that there will be nearly 5,000 openings for carpenters alone in the next 10 years meaning we need to find new carpenters each, 500 new carpenters each year just to keep the workforce we have now. That's why we're here today to bring awareness to these jobs and the pathways that are available to folks interested in entering the field. Two of the gold standard programs of Vermont are the, electric, the electrical and plumbing apprenticeship programs operated by VTC in conjunction with the Vermont, Vermont Department of Labor. These programs are supported by Vermont businesses that value the learn while you earn philosophy and step up year after year to make this reality, to make this a reality for hundreds of students. Apprenticeships across the country are a great way to get into these careers. In 2021, 241,000 new apprentices entered nationally recognized trades training programs, bringing the total number of apprentices across the country that year to nearly 600,000. Here in Vermont, there were roughly 2,000 active apprentices in 2021. And the data shows that roughly 80% of all graduates will still be employed four years from then. And over those four years, their wages are expected to increase at twice the state average. The bottom line is these are good jobs and great careers. Skills that come with the ability to own one's destiny. Whether that means working for the same loyal employer for 30 years, or starting your own business and becoming the boss yourself. There are real opportunities in construction. They're available right now, and the Department of Labor is happy to be here to help highlight them today. With that, I'd like to pass it on to Ronnie Basden, Executive Director of the Vermont Works for Women. I want to thank Governor Scott for inviting me here today and for focusing on diversifying the construction and trades industries. At Vermont Works for Women, we promote economic justice by advancing gender equity and supporting women and youth in all stages of their career journeys. Over the past few years, we have seen the demand and interest in training and construction work for women. Our Trailblazers trains training program, our classes remain full, and we have certified 83 women ages 16 to 65 through this program. Yet, Nationwide, we continue to see only 11% of women are in construction occupations with only 3% tools in hand and the majority of women holding desk and administrative roles. It is also worth mentioning that over half of women leave these occupations due to discrimination and unsupportive workplace culture. With our growing labor and workplace shortages and with our growing demand for construction needs, women are an untapped resource in the potential workers who are motivated, ready, and able to take on these careers. Vermont Works for Women seeks to provide representation, equity, and access to career pathways. Through our Women Can Do conference happening this Thursday, over 300 high school students will use chainsaws, explore welding, and take on flight simulation. We also are one of nine states selected to work with the U.S. Department of Labor Women's Bureau to develop an equity plan that will help Vermont in accessing infrastructure funding opportunities while ensuring that we are increasing job opportunities that construction can provide while meeting the application or meeting the obligation to provide equitable pathways. We are excited to partner with employers, education systems, and industries to ensure that we are providing access, exposure, and representation among these exciting careers. We are proud to partner with many standing here today, and we are proud to support the governor's initiatives around increasing construction and trades career pathways and opportunities for Vermont's future. I would now like to turn it over to Joshua Reap, president of the Associated Builders and Contractors of Vermont and New Hampshire. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, you know, for us uh, at, at the Associated Builders and Contractors, uh, one of the things that are most important to us near and dear is to help make awareness and bring awareness to the opportunities that are here for in construction and we want to thank Governor Scott and everyone in the room today for supporting our industry and being part of helping to deliver opportunity and pathways into the careers that we have available today. 
10 years ago, it was uh, it, a problem. We didn't have enough workers, but we got by. We made do. Uh, today, fast forward 10 years, it's a crisis, and it's a crisis of opportunity for uh, people of all walks of life to come into our trades and get upskilled, uh, be it as a carpenter, as a welder, as an equipment operator. There's plenty of opportunity, and you can make your own uh, pathway with that. And uh, a lot of those opportunities come through registered apprenticeship. So I'm very excited to see that there's some opportunity that came through SB 11 to help promote careers in construction through apprenticeship and other ways and pathways. Um, the ABC for us, apprenticeship is one of those things that's near and dear to our heart. Uh, we have about 300 members in our chapter here in New England, and a um, majority of them use uh, apprenticeship every day. And that apprenticeship is a great pathway to help upskill and get people into the careers right away. And uh, we just encourage people to take a look at those opportunities that are out there. Um, there's a number of them, and the best way to do that is contact a local contractor, contract a, a trade association, association like ours and others um, to uh, get engaged and get involved. Um, you know, here in Vermont alone, we have do dozens and dozens of jobs that are available, and there's just going to be more and more opportunity as uh, people retire, as opportunity grows as well. Um, this is an excellent opportunity to stay here, to live here, to work here. Um, opportunity is boundless here in Vermont, and uh, we're really excited to be part of that today and uh, just really happy that we can make, raise awareness by making October uh, the month to, to bring to attention people the opportunities that there are in construction careers today. And uh, I know we have a number of people in the back of the room as well um, that are contractors that are here. They're here because, in part, this is an issue that's important to them, uh, and uh, we're really happy that they're here to support us in this initiative today as well as the young people that are in the room too. So thank you. Without further ado, um, I don't think you want to hear any more from me, but uh, I would like to introduce our good friend uh, Dick Wabi for the Executive Vice President of Associated General Contractors of Vermont. Thank you. And I as well would like to uh, thank you guys from the uh, Enosburg area for joining us today and point out I've Brian, Byron Furman, Pete Kelly, and Chris Magnan have taken an hour or two off, so there might be a project that's a little behind, Joe. <laughs> Workforce, good afternoon. And thank you all for being here, and thank you all for recognizing the importance and fulfilling future that's built with a career in construction. It's good to see you all at the table. I'm happy. We look forward to sharing how AGC Vermont is working to promote the trades. As many of you have heard recently, AGC Vermont has been recognized nationally as one of the nation's outstanding chapters, in part for our work in workforce development and building careers in construction. Governor, I as well attended Spalding. I was also drawn to industrial arts. I took my college prep courses again in the morning and then would head off not to machine trades. It's not just the machinists, the building trades, the diesel mechanics, the engineers. It takes a whole community to build our future and to build Vermont. And that's why it's so pleasing to see all of you here today working together so we can accomplish so much more. This year, AGC Vermont partnered with Deputy Degree and the folks at Labor to put on Vermont's largest career fair. Over 120 recruiters attended and over 1,400 potential hires searching for a career in Vermont participated. As a result of that and other programs we've collaborated on, we have seen an increase of 2,500 people, new folks, entering the construction trades this year. That's the good news. The bad news is, in that same time frame, we've lost almost 2,000. They've left us. I believe, with your recognition today, we as a group, not just AGC, not just Vermont Works for Women, and not just ABC of New Hampshire, but we as a group can collaboratively work together to build tomorrow's careers and those communities we all thrive in. As you said earlier, Governor, when you build something, you can see the fruits of your labor right before your eyes. 
It's tangible. It's visible. And oh, so fulfilling. Join us today to build a career in construction. I beg you to visit VermontConstructionJobs.com. And thank you all in advance for this opportunity to collaborate with each and every one of you all to build Vermont's future today. Thank you all. I'd like to introduce Dan French, Secretary of the Agency of Education. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wabi. Um, Vermont's construction trades and CT programs are strong uh, thanks to partnerships with the organizations like yours and those that are here today. I'd uh, also like to welcome our students and uh, instructor from Cole Hollow. Good to see you guys. Yeah, we're going to talk a lot about programs, but all that, you know, those are problems we can work on and fix, but if it wasn't for your talent and dedication, we'd, we'd truly be out of luck. So really thank you, and it's great to see you. I hope you're having a good school year. Our CT programs in the state are very strong. Um, and particularly strong despite the challenges of COVID-19. Our CT teachers uh, rose to the occasion uh, to innovate and create ways to ensure our students could continue to make progress in their programs despite the pandemic. Uh, that hard work and innovation can be seen in the numbers. Um, first, I want to talk about some numbers from 2021. 32% um, of Vermont juniors and seniors participated in CTE, so a third of our students. 93% uh, in 2021 of our CT graduates were either employed in the military or enrolled in college or post-secondary training by October of that following year. 25% of our CT graduates earned post-secondary credential in their CT program, and 36% earned college credits while still in high school, so pretty successful. We don't have data yet for this past year, uh, but we will later this fall, uh, but we do anticipate our CT numbers to continue to show solid growth for a number of reasons. Uh, one, for example, um, we know our CT programs continue to expand the credentials that they were offering in 22. Several of those were not available to be offered in 2021 due to the pandemic, so even more credentials were offered this past year. Um, and we've also been working at the agency closely with our centers to uh, expand the number of post-secondary credentials that they offer. We anticipate the percentage of CT students uh, leaving high school with college credits will have also increased largely through the efforts of the Community College in Vermont. Uh, they run a program uh, as part of our dual enrollment approach in Vermont. It's called the Fast Forward Program. Uh, this past year, they offered 79 dual enrollment courses in CT centers. In the prior year, uh, during the first year of the pandemic, it was 52 courses. So significant increase in the opportunity uh, for our CT students to access college credit courses. Uh, CCV also offered a new online course uh, to all CT centers and all CT programs in the areas of business and entrepreneurship, which is, I think, critical uh, to all the career fields uh, that are offered to the CT centers. Um, but our construction trade programs in particular are exceedingly strong in the state. Uh, we have 22 construction trade programs offered across our 16 centers and their approved programs. Um, I'm gonna share some of the highlights of what the students can do in these programs, but again, uh, the students in the, here today, we wanna thank you, and uh, you guys are the, the best of the best, so to speak, so I really appreciate you being here. Uh, students in construction technology, one of our core programs, earn a National Center for Construction Education Research Core Certificate, also Level 1 Carpentry Certification. So basically, they come out of these programs ready to go. Uh, students in HVAC program uh, earn post-secondary credentials, EPA 680 Safe Refrigerant Certification, uh, and also the Bronze Oil Heat License from the National Oil Heat Research Alliance. Our electrical technology program, uh, as Deputy Commissioner Degree mentioned, is aligned with the Registered Apprenticeship Program. Uh, student participation in the program leads to completion of the first year of the registered apprenticeship uh, coursework and students who come back for the second year uh, can uh, take the second year course curriculum from the state's apprenticeship program. So really smooth partnership there. Uh, and CTE programs and particularly the construction trade programs as you've heard mentioned are vital uh, to the success of our economy but as the governor mentioned they also can provide a very lucrative career path for our students. Uh, so what's next for CTE in Vermont? You know basically uh, we're working on three things. One is uh, we're, we're making investments to develop new programs in CTE. Uh, secondly, uh, we're working to really reduce the barriers that make it sometimes challenging for students to access these programs. And thirdly, we want to do a much better job of promoting uh, the value of CTE across the state. Uh, in terms of making uh, new investments, Governor Scott has dedicated a significant portion of what we call the Governor's Emergency Education Relief uh, COVID funds, what we sometimes call GEAR for short. Uh, to support new innovative CTE programs. 
Uh, about 500,000 will be used to establish or expand, pro expand programs uh, related to electronic transportation. Uh, these funds will be used uh, for electric aviation or electric vehicle programs. $15 million from our Ed Fund surplus uh, will, will be used to create a new innovative grant program called the Construction Rehabilitation Experiential Learning Program. Uh, under this program, CT centers can apply for funds to expand their construction problem, uh, programs to include renovating properties in their communities. Uh, this program will uh, do two important things. One is uh, help meet a critical need relative to housing in the state uh, by renovating existing housing stock, but it also provides students a very unique opportunity to work from the very beginning on a construction project um, to get uh, basically exposure to all aspects of housing construction, but it also uh, provides an opportunity for them to give back to their communities. The second area of focus for us will be to eliminate barriers to CTE programs. Uh, one such barrier we've identified is possibly the CTE funding system itself. Uh, we worked with the legislature last year uh, to commission a study of, of the funding system. Joint Fiscal Office will be leading that up. Um, they will be producing some models of some changes to that, and we hope to bring forward some recommendations in the next legislative session uh, to see what we can do to make the CTE funding system uh, more responsive to the needs of students and basically to have the money follow the students in a more flexible way. Uh, lastly, uh, we want to do more to promote the value of CT programs for all students. Uh, too often, uh, CT is viewed as being relevant for some students, or we force, force students to choose between CT and other academic programs. Uh, CT has value for all students, and it should not be an either-or proposition for any student. As I mentioned previously, about 32% of our students participate in CT programs in the prior year. Uh, but we think more students would benefit and enjoy participating in these programs. Part of the challenge is just getting the word out, uh, but it's also about educating people about the quality and the relevance of these programs and how they can be useful for all students, not just some. With that in mind, uh, Governor Scott has directed $1 million of the GEAR funding to be uh, focused on an ambitious marketing campaign to reintroduce career technical education to all Vermonters. Our goal is to make sure that prospective students, families, and all Vermonters understand the value of CTE programs. Our CTE programs offer a tremendous value to our economy and our students, and we need to do more to promote these programs in all regions of the state. Uh, thank you, and I'll turn it back over to the governor. So at this time, read the proclamation first, and then I'll sign it. Whereas, Careers in Construction Month shall be a month designated to increase public awareness and appreciation of construction craft professionals in the entire construction industry workforce. And whereas, during this month, employers, associations, and schools are encouraged to conduct outreach and hold events to inform young Vermonters of the vast career employment and internship opportunities available throughout the Vermont construction industry. And whereas, the construction field is one of our nation's largest industries employing more than 5 million individuals in the United States. And whereas it is estimated that nationally, the construction industry will need 1.9 million new workers by the year 2025. And whereas Vermont recognizes construction professionals and the critical role they play in both the development of our state and making our residential and commercial buildings more energy efficient to reduce the impact on the environment and improve Vermont's quality of life. And whereas the National Center for Construction Education and Research was created by the construction industry to standardize training and enhance the industry by promoting the hard work and dedication of our nation's craft professionals. And whereas the mission of the center's Build Your Future initiative is to narrow the skills gap by guiding America's youth and displaced workers into opportunities that lead to long-term rewarding careers in construction. And whereas the Vermont Department of Labor has partnered with industry leaders to create VermontConstructionJobs.com and Vermont's largest career fair and career pathways to ensure that Vermont youth are aware of the opportunities that come with a career in construction. Now, therefore, I, Philip E. Scott, Governor, hereby proclaim October 2022 as Careers in Construction Month in Vermont. With that. You want to gather around a little bit, make for a better picture? Could, how about, it's, we're here for these guys. Oh, sure, how yeah. about we get those guys behind you?
Merci. It might depend on um, the job as well, the right. position, um, and what uh, what the employers need at that point in time. Is there anybody from industry who'd like to answer that? Just let me toss it out. You stumped the whole crew. <laughs> yes. Can you tell me a little bit more about the publicity campaign? Dan, you go to yeah. So we're. Um, as I mentioned, we're dedicating federal relief dollars on that, and uh, we put out a request for proposals, and we recently uh, finalized a contract with a vendor, or it's about to be finalized to the point where I could mention their name, but uh, we'll, be, we'll be getting that information out pretty quickly. So the contract is in the process of being finalized. It's a Burlington marketing firm. Uh, so we'll be working closely with them to uh, leverage all our communications assets of the state to promote these programs. Other questions? Kind of related to that, Governor. Um, you're drawing the ladder swallowing and U32 vote closed yesterday due to short staffing. Uh, are they open today? And do you see staffing related school closures as a widespread long term problem? And what's the state doing about it? Well, again, as we've said numerous times during many of these uh, press briefings, uh, we have a workforce challenge on our hands in Vermont uh, across every single sector. Um, and that uh, holds true uh, for state government uh, as well as in the education community, whether that's uh, teachers, uh, bus drivers, uh, maintenance staff, uh, and so forth. So it does impact us. Uh, so we're uh, razor thin in terms of having any um, any you know, room uh, for uh, for widespread uh, illnesses and so forth. So I don't know whether they're open today, maybe Secretary French. I haven't heard otherwise, Guy. Um, we asked them to send us a courtesy notice, notice when they do close their schools, but I haven't heard today that they are closed. I assume they're open. And it is uh, cold and flu season is starting, and we have to be all be aware of that. Um, I would advocate, uh, and we'll talk more about this next week, but uh, everyone getting their, their flu uh, vaccine, uh, as well as their COVID vaccine, as well their booster. Have we ever heard anything on those instances uh, as to whether that was, uh, say, COVID-related or was it flu-related? I, I think it's all the above is what I heard, but maybe you have more information. Yeah, I, uh, I haven't had a chance to talk with the U32 superintendent, but I did reach out to the Barry superintendent yesterday. Um, and as the governor mentioned, I think it's all of the above. Uh, certainly illness uh, and certainly some COVID-19 illness, uh, but also, you know, the razor thin margin, if you will, with, with lack of substitutes. So it doesn't take much uh, for some of our buildings that have uh, a pattern of illness and then complemented by a lack of subs to uh, push them over. So it was a, co a combination of factors yesterday. Do any of these young men go to the Gila Los schools? I wonder they're all from Enosburg, I believe. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. Sir, sir. Governor, there's uh, an international uh, uh, well, a meeting of the uh, Canadians down here this, this week uh, in Burlington. Do you see that as a, a follow-on to your trip uh, north? Well, week? certainly uh, we enjoy uh, a lot of similarities with, uh, with our Canadian friends in Quebec in particular and we welcome them here. I think we have a lot 
to gain both sides and uh, we welcome them here to uh, to seek out those opportunities so um, I think it was planned before I went to Quebec um, but um, but this won't be the last of, uh, of those trips back and forth across the border and we're very happy that they um, they uh, did away with the arrive can and uh, making that uh, that trip uh, somewhat easier for for both Vermonters and uh, our Canadian friends. Uh, do you see that as an opportunity tying in with this here, uh, an opportunity for folks to maybe get a leg up uh, as far as employment to the uh, industries that you're hoping to get down here? Well, again, I think that there are a number of, uh, of companies uh, who I spoke with when I was there uh, that want to have a footprint in the U.S. So they are looking for opportunities in Vermont uh, because we're so close geographically, uh, as well as uh, uh, just uh, who we are as people. So um, there will be a lot of opportunity for renovations and new build out and so forth. So um, this is where the future is uh, here. There's going to be, again, with all the ARPA money uh, that we have at our disposal, all the investments we want to make, the IIJA, and all the normal, uh, every day, the maintenance and so forth um, that we, we do on a, on a yearly basis is, uh, is adding up to a, a, tre a tremendous amount of work uh, over the next few years. So there won't be any uh, lack for opportunity for any of uh, these kids that you see here before you today. I'm sure um, it, and there's probably some contractors right in the back of the room uh, that are giving them uh, applications as they leave. Substitute teacher application. Any follow up on that uh, meeting, as far as that goes, on your meeting uh, up north? Um, yeah, it, it, absolutely. Uh, we are in contact. Uh, our agency of commerce and community development is in contact with a number of companies who we we visited, spoke to. Um, and uh, the interest is, is there, and, and I'm, I'm confident they'll be building uh, in, the, uh, in the months and years to come. Uh, Governor, uh, just speaking of empowering girls and, and students to learn, parents and members of the Randolph girls volleyball team uh, say a biological male transgender student was watching them dress in a locker room transgender students says no, the harassment was coming from the girls. Uh, any thoughts on how Randolph and other school boards, staff, students, and parents should move forward on this? Well, again, I don't have all the details on that issue. I've read different accounts. Um, I will say this. Um, we have to be open-minded, understanding, with empathy, and uh, to put ourselves in someone else's shoes and uh, to try and take the hate out of this entire situation. So whatever we do as we move forward, uh, we need to, to make sure uh, that we do so uh, without uh, all of the, um, I guess, divisiveness uh, that we're seeing um, because uh, we have to be more understanding. So that would be my advice. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to that, Secretary French. Yeah, to your question, Guy. Um, you know, certainly I think school districts have uh, the required policies to address these types of issues. Discrimination in any form is illegal and not to be tolerated in schools. Uh, particularly, uh, I've seen some claims of bullying and harassment. Districts also have a policy on that that outlines the process for investigation. So at this point, we need to and expect the school district to work through uh, those, those administrative procedures they have in their toolbox, so to speak. Uh, to ensure the student rights are protected, but also the due process uh, procedures are followed uh, to do a proper investigation of the claims. You see the problem, though, that some parents might have with the biological male watching their daughters change? I mean, that, that some of them are reacting very strongly to that. Yeah, I, I totally understand that. and. Uh, you know, again, their school districts have options on how to how to implement these uh, kinds of concepts. Uh, to the governor's point, it, it's not it's not helpful necessarily. Uh, you know, I know Randolph's feeling this, but now this isn't a national media, and they're feeling all kinds of outsiders who who don't understand the Randolph community, let alone the Randolph school. 
Um, and again, school districts have the tools in place to uh, process these types of issues. And Vermont's blessed to have uh, local control, local school boards where parents can express their concerns. Um, so I'm confident, and again, at the agency, we expect the school district to leverage those tools uh, to do what's best for the community, but also to ensure student rights are protected. I just think we all have an obligation to dial down the rhetoric and, uh, and, and listen uh, to, to uh, the details and, and the facts. Governor, a fairly violent weekend in uh, Burlington again. Uh, the reaction and perhaps uh, some sort of uh, anything that the uh, state can do yeah, well, we're doing a lot to try and help out. Uh, you know, we implemented our 10-point safety plan. Uh, we are in contact, uh, constant contact. We've embedded uh, some of our VSP um, detectives in that region uh, to help out. It's not just Burlington, but the whole Chittenden County region in itself. Um, and we've, uh, we've joined uh, ATF and uh, the U.S. Attorney and others as well. So. Uh, this isn't going to turn around overnight, um, but we are uh, committed uh, to turning this around. Uh, I think uh, enough is enough. Uh, we have to look at uh, the illicit uh, drug trafficking. I think that that's the root of most of the problems that we're seeing. And uh, we have to have, uh, again, more of an emphasis on, uh, on enforcement in this, in this uh, case. Um, I think that, again, are reflecting on what was done in Burlington, uh, the answer isn't to defund the police. Uh, I think we need to challenge ourselves to do all we can to protect uh, the general public. That's an obligation of, of any government. How can that be fixed? Uh, the, uh, the chief yesterday actually uh, said that the majority of the instances in Burlington actually weren't drug-related, uh, that they were interpersonal. But uh, he did say that they got basically clobbered, uh, I think, by the people who uh, possibly defunded them or at least uh, sort of shortened up the, uh, shortened up the roster, so to speak. Yeah. Well, the information I'm receiving is that uh, a lot of it is tied. They're known uh, to, the, to the community, to law enforcement, and right. a lot of it is tied to the illicit drug trafficking. I'm told you're aware of an incident where a retired police officer and veteran of gay liberation was assaulted by trans activists at the September 18th Pride Parade in Burlington again. Um, are your public safety and human rights people looking into this? Um, I don't know all the details of that either, uh, Guy. Um, but I will say that uh, any violence of any nature um, is uncalled for and, and we shouldn't tolerate it. So everyone should be treated equally. But I don't know the details of that situation. Um, following back up on, uh, on Burlington, um, is the message getting out there uh, to maybe hold off on uh, coming to Vermont? Are you concerned about that? Uh, both in Burlington especially, you're talking to students and prospective students, uh, tourism? Um, you know, obviously we're always concerned about one of our largest industries, um, tourism in particular, but we have seen no uh, signs of it slowing down at this point. Uh, in fact, it looks like it's going to be a record year uh, for tourism in Vermont. Okay, thanks again very much.